So uh, Roland said he would put the um, subject of growth, uh, residential growth, on a um, upcoming agenda. He was going to put it for today, um, but he wrote to me and said he wants to postpone because staff want to be involved and need to be prepared. Um, but I wasn't going to ask for a discussion that made any decisions or, you know, I think required um, staff support. But sure, I think that's great. Uh, so I'm here to kind of get an idea of the types of things that people might like to talk about because he asked for an outline and I was going to ask for metrics because if staff's going to be involved, might as well ask for net metrics. And one of the things I was going to ask for is uh, FTEs per um, thousand people. I think that was the metric that they gave me back when I was a selectman. It was very helpful to see that the, despite what you might think, um, that there's more FTEs per thousand over time, at least there has been uh, in the past. I'd like to see what that is. Also, the number of acres uh, being developed per year um, because the issue of water is coming up, um, the issue of uh, when, at what point do we cross over the line where we're no longer water independent because we have to get water from outside of town. So I, I was thinking that those might be appropriate metrics and looking for feedback from you guys. So if you want to email me, that type of thing. Also, I was concerned uh, that the subject would be after the July 24th presentation by the town-sponsored uh, um, consultant that was hired to convince us that um, if we don't have more housing that we won't ever have businesses or we won't have enough businesses or something like that. So this consultant is being paid for by housing agencies to convince us that we need more housing and is taking a, a sl the slant that they've been assigned at the state Baker is trying to pass his housing choice bill. Nonetheless, uh, the assignment is to go get more people to, if you want to see the RFP, write to me again. I've sent it a couple of times to the FinCon, but um, uh, the RFP says that part of the consultant assignment is to uh, look for more people to come to town meeting that don't usually come so that they can vote for the rezoning at Kelly's Corner. So um, anyways, so I hope that we talk about this sooner than the July 24th, but either way, I like that we are talking about it and uh, looking for feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. You said that's before the July 24th meeting that you'd like to come in? I'd like that, yeah, okay. that'd be great, because um, there's, tw in the United States, because they're talking about housing crisis, uh, and just another minute here, um, there's 20 homeless, excuse me, there's 20 empty housing units for every homeless person in the United States. There's five empty housing units for every homeless person in Massachusetts. The crisis that they're talking about is the crisis of their own pocketbooks. There uh, used to be about 20,000 permits statewide for new housing units every year, and it's down to like 16,000, 15,000, and so it's a crisis for them, for sure. Um, but the more they build, it doesn't solve the problems of the people who are actually housing insecure. And I have all those figures, and I plan to present them. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have next that Steve will um, go over OPEB with us. Thank you. All right, so you've probably all heard the term. Um, some of you have been on the committee for a few years, probably have uh, a working knowledge of what I'm about to talk about. And then some of you probably still don't understand what it is and why it's an issue. Um, so first, briefly, why, well, it's other post-employment benefits. It means something we pay for after our employees retire. Um, there's a little bit of group life, uh, but almost all of it is medical care. Um, and um, the, in Massachusetts, Help me out, Brian, is a chapter 32 um, that once you adopt it says you will pay no less than 50% of your retirees' uh, medical costs um, for life. Now, you can pay more. I don't know that anybody does, but um, you can. You have to pay 50%. Um, from the time medic medical care was invented or municipal government was invented till um, 
a few years ago, about 15 years ago. Um, it was just for, it was paid for each year in the budget. It was no big deal. Um, there was no reason to um, have a liability. Uh, it just got paid like the uh, health care of the um, current employees. Um, in the private sector in the early 90s, um, there was a Financial Accounting Standards Board ruling, test my memory, 106, I think, <laughs> um, that talked about, well, you know, you have to uh, measure, you have to calculate, and in the private sector, you had to fund uh, this liability. Uh, it was part and parcel of a whole thing that had been going on about funding, calculating liabilities on pensions. Um, and um, with that, if it wasn't um, a public utility or a, a unionized plan, for the most part, the private sector did away with OPEP. Uh, and pretty much in the early 90s, just about every major corporation who had been providing retiree health care opted to stop it. Now, there's, there was no law that required them to do it, so they, they could. Um, so in the early 2000s, the Government Accounting Standards Board, or GASB, um, picked up on the same issue. Um, and there, um, we say, well, is it important? I mean, it's private sector, it's public sector, they're different. Well, they meet in, in a place um, called the bond market. So if you're a fixed income investor, you, you could be looking to invest in bonds, you could be looking to invest in corporate bonds or municipal bonds, state bonds, uh, bonds of hybrid governmental agencies. Um, and typically, if you're looking for um, municipal bonds, you were willing to take a um, slightly lower rate of return because it had a better income tax effect. Um, but it was noticed that there was a vast difference in the liability. Uh, these corporate bonds, if you will, no longer had an OPEB liability hanging over them. Um, and not every state in the union re has the same requirement that Massachusetts does. A lot of them do, but some of them don't. Some of them don't provide um, retiree health care. So they had no OPEB liability either. So at that point, the Government Accounting Standards Board decided that to somewhat level a playing field, um, they, that um, government entities that had uh, retiree health care needed to start um, measuring it. Um, the FASB tends to make pronouncements and they implement them fairly quickly. Uh, the GASB, it's like death by a thousand cuts. So, but that started 15 years ago and I'll, I'll bring you along with the history as we go. But that's why, why it's an issue, or why it became an issue. All right, so which way does this one go? This one? Ah, got to be on to do it. Okay, so other post-employment benefits. As I said, it's, it's re we're required to pay 50% of our retirees' health care. So what OPEB represents, or should represent, is the future cost of providing these health benefits that had technically already been earned by the employees uh, and the retirees. Every year they work, they technically earn uh, this benefit. Um, in the past, uh, both the town and the school district, like just about everybody, just paid it as they went along. It was called pay as you go. Um, but then the rules changed. GASB 45 required us to calculate it and report it. Um, the unfunded por portion had to be um, recorded on your financial statements, but only, only the 2009 piece and going forward. They kind of forgot about all those other years. Um, this is the little cut. Um, 
But GASB 78, as of 2017, um, requires uh, us to show the entire unfunded liability. Uh, funding is not required. So this is a, just an example of um, an employee's uh, lifetime cost. So an example is that this is a person who works 30 years and retires at 55. Um, so you can see the first section, um, they're, they're earning their um, OPEB, but they're, they're being, the, the medical costs being paid. Um, then they retire. Um, now, when they retire at 55, um, then we pay 50% of the going rate uh, for whatever they have, individual or family coverage, uh, until they hit the age of 65. Um, and then we pay 50% of whatever Medicare um, premium or whatever they, they, and they have to do it. That they have no choice, they have to sign up for Medicare at 65. Um, but as you can see, you know, if you try and count the, the space under the curves, we, we pay just about as much for an employee uh, in retirement as we did in their working life, mostly because of inflation. So that's a, a, an illustrative example of what the problem is. So how do you calculate an OPEB liability? Um, well, first, you need an actuary. Um, and the actuary is then going to look at your demographic data, you know, the age, uh, gender, um, because they want to calculate mortality tables. Uh, this is till death, and they want to know when people will die. Uh, and they look at your eligibility, uh, when do they qualify for the coverage, um, and they look at your health coverage, specifically your plan design, uh, then they're going to look at health care trends, uh, and then they're going to make assumptions about the behavior of all these elements for the next 30 years, uh, and then they're going to make assumptions about investment returns for the next 30 years. Um, and with that information, with that I guess, pyramid of assumptions, they will come up with a number. So if you think it's subject to some inaccuracy, yes, it is. Now, this is a wholly um, imperfect comparison of the OPEB liability over the years. I say it's imperfect because it's apples and oranges and pears. It starts off in 2008, uh, and uh, at that time, uh, the public schools, the Acton Public Schools were part of the town, uh, and there was no Boxborough in these numbers. Uh, and then we move forward uh, to th 2014 when um, the Acton Public Schools uh, employees have moved over to the district, Boxborough's come into the district, and it's pretty hard to separate out um, from their numbers what's, what's Boxborough and what isn't. Uh, I will note that the, um, those teachers or employees that retired from the Acton Public Schools uh, before regionalization uh, remain on the um, town's accounts. So. But, as you can see, when we first ran the actuarial reports, um, the liability was $100 million. Now, to some extent, this was a perfect storm of um, recession investment returns, which were projected not to be so great, um, health care inflation, which was running rampant at the time, eight, ten percent a year. Compounded out 30 years, that gets to be a big number. Uh, so for several years, everybody just sat and looked at that number and went, what the, are we going to do with that? Um, 
and people's, you know, um, views tended to, to vary. Uh, some people believed it's a ridiculous number and the state will, will somehow fund it. Um, they never did. Uh, others believe that the state would change the law uh, and, and reform it such that it would go away. Uh, a bill was filed back when Governor Patrick was governor to actually amend the eligibility and change a lot of the rules. Probably would have cut our liability in half, uh, but it died um, without ever it died in committee, basically, without ever anybody ever taking a vote on it. So at that point, we realized the state was not going to do anything. Um, now, there's two parts to OPEB. And like I said, it's based on the concept that each year you should put away funds to pay for the future benefit uh, that your employees earn. You can, you can almost draw this same analysis to your kids in college. Um, you think your kids are going to go to college and you wait until um, they're a senior in high school to start thinking about how you're going to pay for it, you may have a problem. And essentially that's what every city and town in the state had been doing, just putting it off and putting it off. Yeah, we. Yeah, we have that liability. We know we have that liability out there, but you know, putting money aside for something like that, that you know, that's a tough thing to do. And so in fact, nobody did it because nobody actually was required to do it. Um, so there's two pieces to it. Um, in, the, in 2017, they changed all the terminology, so, and none, none of them ever made particular sense, but so you have two pieces used to be called normal cost, now it's called service cost. Uh, and that is the amount your current employees are earning every year. Um, the second part was called amortization, now it's called interest on the unfunded liability. And it's the amount you need to cover the retirees for which you never provided any funding. Um, calculation used to be a lot harder, now it's essentially you take the previous year's unfunded balance and multiply it by a discount rate. So how do you disclose this on your financials? Well, like I said, a little bit of a time, over 15 years. So first you calculate the amount and you put it in a footnote on your financial statements. That was pretty harmless. Then you calculate it and you compare your funding uh, to what you're supposed to be funding, not only your normal cost or your current employees, but uh, the cost of all those other people who are retired uh, and you didn't put any money aside. So they calculated something then called an ARC, uh, an annual required contribution. Um, and it had both pieces. So then you had to just say, okay, well, I paid um, $2 million against OPEB this year in my ARC. Uh, was $5 million, so I would have a liability on my balance sheet of $3 million for one year. Again, we're not talking about all those other years. And then we went on like that for a while. Um, each year that $3 million added, you know, it was three, then it was six, then it was nine, then it was 10. Um, and then in 2016, to, uh, they changed it. So now um, they changed the calculation method, um, changed the terminology. So now you record the entire unfunded liability um, on your balance sheet. Uh, and they actually, then you have to add several pages of basically incomprehensible footnotes. Um, but uh, there's still no funding requirement. So the question always has been, well, when does that come? Um, or will it come? So as a town, what did we do? Um, or what have we done? June 2004, GASB 45 was issued. This is when we 
2008. Yeah, in 2008, uh, we actually got the full actuarial report, and that's when we kind of had the aha, what are we going to do about this? Um, and um, in May of 2011, um, which is a time of year the Finance Committee always is looking for new projects, um, they formed a subcommittee. Um, and we studied the, the issue for several months uh, and wrote a report urging some action to be taken. Um, and um, then in 2012, town meeting passed uh, the articles that we proposed to establish two trusts, one for the town, one for the schools, and to begin funding them. Uh, and we're talking fairly modest. Uh, funding. It was important to establish the trust because at that time it had a real solid accounting benefit to it. If you, if you actually established a, a trust and funded it, uh, they allowed you to apply a much better discount rate to your liability than people who didn't do those two things and therefore our liability would begin to shrink. Um, April of 2013, um, uh, actually, in, in 2012, the ALG then uh, formed its own OPEB working group, uh, which took a couple members from uh, the Finance Committee group, uh, a board of selectmen, a uh, representative, uh, a town finance representative, which was Steve uh, Barrett, um, a school committee representative, which was Dennis Bruce, and the then um, school finance officer. It was Don Iacardi. And um, we got fairly lucky because um, the then chair of the planning board, Jeff Clymer, uh, was an actuary. So he became our uh, extra member. And, and essentially, he taught us how all this works. Um, I don't know that we would have got anywhere uh, without him. Um, so then in, in um, April of 2013, this OPEB working group uh, made a pre presentation town meeting uh, with strategies how to reduce the liability and um, some funding strategies. The initial funding targets were set as a percentage of normal or service costs. Um, and our thinking at the time was that the, um, the total required cost was well beyond our, our uh, ability uh, to reach, and that if we funded the current number, uh, we would begin to cap the problem, uh, meaning we would not be adding to the problem, we'd make it go away after 30 years. And, you know, to be brutally frank, um, the retirees would all have died off, and we would have provided funds for all of the ones that were in retiring in the future. Uh, back then, the um, normal cost was 2.2 million uh, per year. Our target um, funding was, uh, for FY15, was 1.1 million, or about 50% of it, stepping up to FY16, uh, funding at 1.4, and we kind of expected or hoped that each year there would be about a, a $300,000 uh, increment to the funding until we eventually got uh, the 2.2. Now, we had, we're still, at that time, we were still hoping the state um, OPEB bill would pass and that 2.2 that might move down <laughs> to about 1.8, and we would actually get there. Um, like I said, it, it didn't happen. Uh, so this is our, our funding history, um, and the schools are in red, the town's in blue. Uh, so as you can see in FY13, the, um, the funding was very, very small. Um, and then each year after that, it started to pick up. Um, in um, one of the important things to note, here is um, 
after the after regionalization and maybe two thirds of the burden was then going to be borne by the school district, um, the town never really cut back their funding. Um, call it great foresight, call it the fact it was already built into their budget, uh, but the fact is they didn't. Um, schools, on the other hand, incrementally increased um, their contribution, uh, but then got to a point, FY17, FY8, you know, it's leveled off. Uh, it's moved up maybe $100,000 uh, from where they, when they initially started. But this is what's happened to liabilities. So, again, the schools are in red and the town's in blue. Um, the, um, the big drop in 2012, 2014 for the town was um, moving APS uh, over to the district. Uh, but then each successive year it has continued to drop and that's because they've held their funding uh, level even though they don't have the same um, normal or service cost. Uh, schools have picked up their funding levels uh, but again, have kept it fairly constant over the years. Um, and it's difficult when you have all the demands that the school committee has every year uh, to, you know, put money towards um, what sounds to be a, um, a, a liability 30 years in the future. So here's the one you've all been waiting for. How do you calculate it? Well, it starts um, with the calculation of the liability. And like I said, this is the, the pyramid of assumptions. Um, and, and, and part of the incomprehensible footnotes I mentioned, uh, they do now do a lot of sensitivity uh, analysis of what would what would the liability be if this assumption was different or that assumption, which is actually not a bad thing, uh, but we still only book one number. Um, so the second line is the OPEB trust balances, and for the town it's about 3.3 million. For the schools it's about a little under 2 million. Uh, so your net OPEB um, number is the difference of the two. So here's the big difference. The service cost for the town is 250000 um, And so when you look at that $600,000 uh, contribution compared to the service cost, there, it's, it's two something times, almost two and a half times uh, the service cost. So they are paying down their past liabilities. Um, the service cost for the schools uh, is 1.6 million, uh, and even at 900,000, uh, which is last year's contribution, uh, they're still not covering. Uh, they're only covering 55% of their their service cost, and have yet to address the um, the past liability. Past liability is um, represented by that interest uh, cost number. Um, so. Um, as you see the contributions to the trust, there's earnings on the trust. Um, so you get down to a net OPEB liability, and these are numbers off of the 630-2018 um, balance sheets that the uh, town OPEB liability is uh, around 16 million, and the schools uh, is 43. Um, now, those are much bigger than they were a couple of years ago because of the new um, Government Accounting Standards Board pronouncement. So a few years ago, that 43 was probably 20, uh, but now they have to show the entire uh, net OPEB liability on their, on their balance sheet. Gone are the days when it was only $3 million. So, as I said, what's this funding represent? Well, the town has funded far more than their uh, 
normal or service cost and their, their liability is decreasing in, in not that many years, uh, it'll be gone. Um, the district has maintained its funding at around 55, which, you know, that's, that's kind of where we started this. Um, and the initial funding target was, you know, 50% of the normal cost. And they've, they've, they've hung in there, uh, but they haven't really uh, increased it. Uh, a few years ago, a couple school committee members asked me what it would take, and at that time I estimated it would take about 1.4 million. Now it's, it's bigger than that. Um, it's um, about 1.6. So they need another $600,000 a year. Um, and anybody who goes to school committee regularly will note that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So the good news is um, when we started this conversation years ago, um, there was no intention in this town of borrowing any money for any purpose. Uh, so when we said, well, you know, someday you're going to need to show some progress on this issue uh, to keep your bond ratings, and they all kind of scoffed at the idea that we would ever need to worry about that. Um, so the good news is that um, what the town has done has been exemplary. Uh, I think very few towns uh, can boast of that good a, uh, a track record in funding OPEB. Uh, and what the schools have done is good compared to many, many other places. They're not doing 55% um, of their service costs. And uh, I think it'll be looked at more as, as uh, a positive uh, when they put the bonds out um, uh, for the twin school uh, than a negative. Any questions? <laughs> How frequently do they recalculate the liabilities every two years? Every two years. It's been every two years. I think actually you have to. Looks like we're looks like we're due in the next couple of months, right? So if it's on the close of 6-30-2019, when do we expect the liability number to be issued to us? It's usually even years. So uh, I think there's well, the town hasn't gotten their report for 2018 yet. No. Um, the schools has. Okay. And it was 41 million. I mean, it, it was slightly lower than the last one, but um, has, it has not changed much. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's every two years. Um, and um, there, you know, what helped to change, lower the liability? Plan design changes. So we recently had another round. Uh, plan design changes um, that was not factored into um, the last OPEB calculation. I don't know whether it was made in, into the, the most recent one or not. Um, and um, but yeah, assumptions haven't changed that much. You know, when we first did these, healthcare trend was eight to ten percent a year. Uh, now it's more like. 5% a year. Um, investment returns, we were, they were using 3.5% a year. Now they're using somewhere between 5 and 7.5% and and a, a year. So the, the liability swings uh, with those uh, assumptions um, more so than, than anything we do. The funds that are in this trust, mm -hmm. um, how aggressively invested are they, or how much risk is there to, if we saw another 2008 or another Lehman situation? Um, the town's um, trust is managed by the state pension, help me out, PRIT, right? Pension? Yeah, it's PRIT. Um, yeah. It's the same one that handles all, handles it's kind of retirement. It's, they're not, they're not as limited to, as the towns and the schools are in terms of depository. You know, I mean, they can pretty much invest 
where they want. Uh, the schools have a, a separate trust fund managed by uh, an independent advisor. Um, and um, I would cal characterize that um, portfolio as moderately aggressive. Um, and, and they each have an investment, you know, uh, policy. And, and yeah, you can't. You can't put it all in CDs because <laughs> you, know, you, you have to uh, build something for the future. But yeah, they, they're in the moderate to moderate aggressive uh, category. Dave? Yeah, you were hinting at this a second ago, but you know, just sort of given the unfunded liability swings, do you think the school committee, um, they may view this as um, a lot more volatile, maybe not volatile, but not nailed down. I mean, admittedly, accounting changes and new standards come out and there are new ways of measuring these, but uh, how do they just think about the number in aggregate? It looks like it's moved around. Um, I haven't talked to a whole lot of school committee members in a while, I, you know. At one time, yeah, I, was, I think I gave a presentation to the Board of Selectmen and one to the school committee. Um, used some of the same charts, actually. Um, but um, different composition of the, both boards uh, at the time. Um, the, the problem with um, both boards, in, in their, they focus on an annual budget. Um, to their to both boards' credit, we, they are now focused on an, um, a long range range capital plan, which they never did before. Um, and um, for the town to be focused on capital and still funding their OPEB is a real good thing. I think schools may have missed an opportunity. Uh, they could have at least bumped the contribution a bit this past year. Uh, but they were also trying to get you know, stabilization uh, fund funded. They, had, they were trying to get their uh, capital improvement plan funded. You know, when you talk about annual budgets, there's so, only so much long-term thinking that you can crowd into one. Um, I mean, I'd like to see the schools pick it up um, in the future. Um, but like I said, at the time uh, we started to do this, um, Dennis Bruce and Donna Accardi were on the original OPEB working group, but you know Don's long gone, and Dennis, other than a brief appearance uh, last year, uh, has been off the committee for a while. Um, so um, now we'll say one good thing: uh, John Peterson, who was on the school committee when. I guess I'd have to call it the OPEB war started, is back on the school committee. So you do have some somebody with some history uh, on the issue. Jason, did you have something? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we all, I may speak for just myself, but I, I think we all appreciate the points and um, it, it to me, it isn't, I mean, it's, it's like pensions and so on. It's just, it's something that needs to be funded. It maybe just, we need like another awareness campaign or just to, yeah. you know, wait for the next set of numbers come out and start getting in front of the ALG or the school committees or the superintendent or whomever, just to, you know, as part of a, how we have our outreach campaigns. This is just one more area that we need to raise awareness in. Um, but thanks for putting it together. I, I, found it to be really informative. I know um, in the past, um, prior to me starting, the Finance Committee was responsible for raising the initial awareness of this and bringing it to the town's attention. So like, I think we have a really good track record, thanks to yourself um, and others. So it would be great just to continue that. I think there's an opportunity in the point of view to make a little stronger statement than we have the last couple of years, which kind of was town, keep, keep going, schools try and pick it up. <laughs> We can make a little stronger statement this year. Two things, if I may. Uh, one, at the last 
school budget Saturday, the presentation about OPEB was lumped together with another topic. And one was due to be fully funded in the 2040s, and one was due to be fully funded in 2092. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes. What's the other topic, and how does that come into play? And is this a case of we need to look at a wider lens, through a wider lens? Well, uh, let me first say that the other topic is one that I have a personal bias on, and that it was Middlesex retirement. Um, so, um, what's what's floated out there as a, a, a strategy um, is, well, Middlesex retirement will be fully funded in X number of years, um, and then we'll take the money that uh, we were contributing to that, and we'll start throwing that against the OPEB liability. Um, it's a good theory, um, and I've told um, the school finance director that he should always say he's going to do it. Uh, he won't be around when it happens. I won't be around. <laughs> a few of you young, younger members may be around when it happens, but it's a good theory. <laughs> it's a good approach. Um, in practice, um, uh, my experience with Middlesex um, retirement over the years has been they've never hit their numbers correctly. They've always uh, been wrong, and I have no reason to believe that they'll ever have that thing fully funded. I mean, we just got hit with an absurd, absurd increase this year. It, it, it happened a couple, three years ago the same way. Um, they don't seem to have a grip uh, on what they're doing. So to, to bank on the one to fund the other, it's a good theory, but I wouldn't count on it. If you blend the two of them together, is it perhaps not, not quite as bad as just Oak Have alone would appear? Or is Middlesex retirement really that bad of a lost cause? Well, a, Middlesex retirement is not a, necessarily in as bad a shape as is the school's OPEP, but to think you're going to solve one with the other is, is a leap of faith. And it's not at all uh, based, in my opinion, on, on experience. Do you think there's enough, sorry, I'm taking two. Do you think there's enough, um, if they were to strictly make an accounting adjustment, if they were to say, we're not going to put as much into the retirement funding as we do now and earmark some of that for the OPEB, if they were to take the same dollar amount and reapportion it, would that have any appreciable impact on their overall retirement liability? Obviously not, but would it, would it make the OPEB number look significantly better? It would make the OPEB number, well, first, the middle sex is an assessment, so you, you, it's not something you, you, you can choose your number. Okay. Uh, they give it to you and you have no choice. Okay. Um, so, um, what, and it won't be fully funded anytime soon. So, this theory is that at some point in 2030, 2040, um, I remember 42 and 92, but that's just my, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, at some point, middle size will be fully funded, and we can then divert money okay. into OPEP since the school's OPEP, yeah. Has, Got it. You know, a, who knows what the end date is now. Um, Got it. Yeah, anything would help. And the last question, and I'll let you go on this. Um, you alluded, you definitely led the horse to water in your slides, that you expect them, expect the state to demand mandatory funding. State when, won't. Do you, when do you expect that to occur? State won't, but the Government Accounting Standards Board will eventually. And is that, that eventually meaning two or three years or 10 to 15 years? Um, I think they have a very difficult decision to make because we're probably in the top 10% of organizations that have dealt with it. they got a whole lot of people out there that still haven't dealt with it. And um, so when we're, <laughs> when we're only talking about that $3 million and <laughs> one year's liability, the funding question is easier to deal with. Now that you hang up a $60 million liability on the combined 
books of the town and schools saying funded is, is a bigger problem. So uh, there's a lot of people out there that haven't done anything. Uh, some big cities. Um, when, when Detroit went bankrupt a few years ago, the OPEB liability was an order of magnitude bigger than the pension liability. Um, the U.S. Postal Service uh, would make money every year, except they have to book an OPEB <laughs> expense. Um, the, the, big, the bigger the organization, the bigger the problem. So uh, I, I would expect if the funding comes, it will, unlike the public sector, it will move in, in again, very small increments. You know, uh, it won't be a fund your whole liability uh, in one uh, fell swoop. But um, it's hard for me to believe that we've gotten this distance in 15 years and they won't ever say you need to fund it. What, the, what they've established at this point is it's a real liability. And, and how long can you go carrying a real liability on your books and not do anything about it? Yeah, that was a good presentation, Steve. And I think uh, you know, this obviously is a very complex, ongoing, and, and scary topic. And I think the OPEB uh, subcommittee <coughs> uh, really deserves kudos for their years of uh, sort of paying attention to this uh, complex problem and, and coming up with a, with a solution. I'm still concerned that we have to, uh, I think, monitor this <clears throat> very closely in the years ahead. And, <clears throat> you know, I'm concerned about the other cities and towns that, are, as you said, aren't, aren't doing anything. They're kicking the can down the road and eventually uh, <clears throat> somebody's going to have to put their feet to the fire and they're going to be looking, screaming for a bailout and I, I don't want that to be us. Uh, you know, they, they have to address those issues just like we did, and uh, they have to be aggressive about it. So, uh, you know, I, I just think we're on the right track, and it's, um, you know, I feel comfortable with um, those strategies. And one also wonder about the, the vulnerability of, of, these, of this plan. If something happens to the economy, if there's a recession, you know, stock market goes south, and uh, you know, how vulnerable <clears throat> our investments would be at, at that point. Again, if, if they start to, investment returns are scaled back, um, you know, it's not so much what you got last year that matters. Um, it's what they assume for the next 30 years that matters. Uh, and if they, assume, if they go back to the 3.5% <laughs> days, those liabilities are going to skyrocket. Um, so um, I haven't heard um, anything about another state OPEB bill. Uh, the last one that was filed um, was going to make a lot of changes to eligibility rules that um, would have, like I said, cut back the liability. That, you know, we are actually um, the actual the actuaries we were using, uh, Siegel and Company, were the consultants to the uh, state legislature. And, you know, um, there was a a blue ribbon committee uh, to study the issue uh, for them. Siegel was the, their consultants. Uh, our data was actually used. Um, we were in the uh, pool uh, of act data they used to make their report. And so we knew very well what, I mean, when other people were talking theoretically what will happen if this bill was adapt adopted, we knew for sure because they were using our data in a few other towns to calculate it. Uh, and it was going to cut the liability in half. Now, there was a... Um, a regional hearing held over in Concord one time, um, myself and, and, and Dave Clough, who was a select one at the time, went over and jumped up, yelled and screamed, <laughs> and got 
no attention whatsoever uh, from the, uh, who was the chair of the, whichever House committee was uh, reviewing the legislation and um, whatever it is when, I guess it's June 30th uh, when legislation dies uh, after it's been on the file. If it's been filed for two, two years, it dies uh, on June 30th. It just died a very quiet death. Um, the state does not consider they have an OPEP problem. Uh, one thing is the state employees, for the most part, are all handled by their group insurance commission, um, which operates much more like a private sector insurance operation. They change copays, they change deductibles, they change whatever they, they want to change, and, and they don't have to negotiate uh, that with anybody. Um, so they, they can somewhat control uh, their liability far better than um, the cities and towns can. Um, we have been fortunate um, because we've had two rounds of coalition bargaining with uh, our unions, in which case, instead of dealing with each union um, separately on, on health care, uh, the unions have formed a uh, negotiating team which represents them all, uh, and they sit down with the town schools and hammer out um, changes, um, mostly to plan design, uh, but uh, there's been two rounds of that. Um, and those have been very significant in the uh, controlling the um, uh, liability. <clears throat> so they'll calculate the uh, unfunded liability by at six thirty uh, at the end of this month. At yep. some point in the future. Yeah, I mean, um, there's going to be a calculation like I just showed you. Um, because I, I took those uh, off of the um, financial statements of 63018. Um, and yeah, you'll have your, uh, maybe you'll have your uh, <laughs> actuarial report. <laughs> um, it's, it's just By funny. the time your numbers go, good final, you will. But yeah. The, the uh, obviously with rates dropping, particularly going into the end of, the end of this quarter and fiscal year is going to make it an even more eye-popping number, I'm sure. It's, um, like I said, it's a pyramid of assumptions. And, and early on in this, a lot of people just looked at it as it's a worthless number. Why should we? Um, why should we even try? Uh, some people still have that attitude. And the Finance Committee at the time said, okay, it's not a hundred million. We agree, but it's not a million either. Yeah. <laughs> we need to start doing something. The, the number, the number could be in a very wide range. Yeah. But, just, uh, you know, lately, last six, eight years, or so it's it's pretty well stabilized. Yeah. The question is, how do we get it down from here? <clears throat> I, I, yeah, that may be so. I just I, the way they I think they do it is they'll project out the future healthcare costs and they discount them back and yep. the discount rate, oh, yeah. as opposed <laughs> to six months ago, is one point two percent lower. So it's going to be a, a decade. Oh yeah, no, it's um, the question I have is uh, sorry if you touched on this, but this uh, rating agency is like really with respect to the schools funding in the, the new the new twin school is. We may be better than all the other towns, but if they look at it and they say, okay, this is still a big number and we're still going to calculate some amount of liability and that can affect the, affect the rating to some extent, um, do you have any sense on what that impact is? I really don't. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think it's mid double. It was it was on negative, and then they moved it to stable. Double A, double A flat. Right? Yeah, I think so. The school. Um, so I mean, it sounds like, yeah, it should be something interesting to watch. But um, it's too little, probably too late to do something now. Yeah. In the next year or two, if the borrowing is going to need to happen, then. So. Anyways, thanks. 
Um, I have a question of whether we should be speaking to the schools in slightly a different way. I've heard in basic financial planning for your life that you should put money aside for retirement and uh, rather than save for your kids' education because you can borrow for your kids' education but you can't borrow for your retirement. Should I'm, I know we're happy they're doing a stabilization fund, but some of those things can be borrowed for in the future. Should we be encouraging more money into OPEB and less into the stabilization fund or other um, capital there, projects? There was uh, early on um, a, a theory in some, I don't think anybody locally ever did it, but it, there was a concept of OPEB bonds um, that you would float uh, bonds uh, to pay off your OPEP liability. Um, and I always just kept shaking my head at it, and I was thinking, uh, okay, so I've got a liability now. I'm going to incur another liability to get the asset to, you know. <laughs> it's like it, yeah, it's, it, it never made any sense to me. And... Um, Frankly, I never would have been confident enough of a number to say how much should we go out and borrow because uh, the, the number was too squishy. Um, um, personal advice, uh, I wouldn't uh, borrow for either my kid's education or my retirement. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> uh, what I'm asking is whether we um, should recommend to the school, uh, the district, that they shift some of the money that they're looking to put aside for borrowable, thing, borrowable things, such as um, capital items that the stabilization fund is for, and that we encourage them to direct some of that money into OPEB. Uh, I'd be reluctant to do that, um, simply because, um, personally, I've been pushing them to do both for so long uh, that now that they're finally doing one, I feel I was being two-faced to say, okay, <laughs> now do the other. Cut but some of us haven't pushed them on anything yet. So. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> Tara. Yes, um, I'd like to ask Steve a couple of questions and like a follow-up and to make sure I understand what the heck's going on. I, I've, I've, is it okay? So, Steve, it's okay? Go ahead. Um, now, I'm sure I've asked you these questions before and you're probably giving me the same answers. Um, Thereabouts, the discount rate that is used to calculate the liability, mm -hmm. what is that number? It depends. Okay, what was it last year? <laughs> what was it in the last year? It does. <laughs> to it make does. it easier. <laughs> um, I, I don't have the statement. The reason I ask it, is... That. You'll find it in the financial statements of both the town and the schools okay, on page you. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask is I noted that the payment um, line item, uh, and I'll get to my question in a moment, but the payment line item for the town was almost as much as the payment item for the school. And since the school, I think, has like two-thirds of the employees, I th and they probably would have two-thirds of the retirees, I was wondering about that. But the real question is, is this a debt that we owe, or is this a debt that some government agency has calculated that they think we owe? Does that make any sense? Um, trying to back into the discount rate looks to be about seven percent on the town side, which is would be high. Seven percent is a discount rate. That seems really high. Uh, yeah. So, um, do we owe it? Well, it's not. Um, it's not unlike Social Security. Um, government, in this case the town uh, of Acton, the Acton Boxborough School District, has made promises to pay for things in the future um, that they don't have enough money so the payment, to uh, okay. fund. So therefore, it's it's a real liability. Yes. So the not, one not, point, a, not a general government, some level. No, it's we, we did it. 
ourselves. Right. So the three, and I'm totally in favor of pensions. I'm not suggesting anything different. I'm wondering though, the three point something that we pay out every year, if OPEB, the organization, the fund, whatever, went away, we would still pay that to our retirees. Correct. Right. So this debt, this liability, um, if we're in the 10% where we're good, is this whole organization made up of debt? Where are their holdings if nobody's paying into it more than they're using? Who's, who are you talking about? Well, we, if we have we 100 have million. accounts uh, with the State Pension Board and with, um, I think it's Commonwealth Advisors, um, and those are our trust funds. Uh, there, but, there's no general OPEP. <laughs> <laughs> it's town by town, it's organization by organization. But I think what you're saying by the town by town thing is that if we own 100 million and we're in the good, like we're of the, the, the good 10%, that the rest of everybody makes a much larger liability. And I'm saying that that's a liability, but where are the assets? And so if there are in fact assets, if we continue to pay into those assets, and we, we can never. We, we paid into our assets, our trust funds, uh, against our liability. What other towns, cities uh, do, they have to do it individually. Um, there was a time when people thought the state was going to make it go away. They didn't. They've had 15 years to make it go away. Okay. Uh, well, they had a golden opportunity. They had a good bill that they chose to let it die. So they're not going to make it go away. Um, you know, if it's the combined liability of the schools and towns and acting is 60 million, think about the, when you add up the total state's liability, how big it could be. The uh, state doesn't have that kind of money. They're barely uh, balancing their budget as it is. So um, th th there's nobody that's going to bail this one out. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just add one point is I think the federal government's unfunded liability for Medicare is like 50 or 60 trillion. So I mean, it's the same sort of concept. There's a bunch of benefits that have been promised to somebody and Absolutely. the government technically owes 60 trillion. There's no, I mean, they could liquidate state parks and stuff like that, but they're not going to come up with that. And our problem is we don't print money. Uh, the federal government has that ability. <laughs> If I could just clarify what I said earlier, I, I did look it up to make absolutely sure the Acton Boxer Regional School District is rated AAA by S&P. By Moody's, it's AA2 with no outlook. Well, I think the, um, the... No is better than negative. Right. <laughs> well, I think the AAA out, uh, rating is the way that they do ratings on a business is different than they do ratings on a town. In a town, the rating is not like how healthy is the town. I was just it's, informing where we're at, thank you. Yes, it's how likely are the property owners, how likely are they to be able to pay back the debt? So, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Welcome. And now we're gonna go on to dis us the um, point of view, the current state we've gotten it to, and um, any other work that we decide needs to happen following on to this. Okay, between the end of school year and uh, camping expedition, uh, I haven't had time to actually schedule any kind of POV subcommittee, so I just made some changes to this document myself based on previous conversations. So we just have a few slides to look at today. Um, this one has been updated. Um, the uh, unemployment rate is looking spectacular at the moment. Um, We just had a discussion about this slide and how we really would love to be using the median um, to properly represent Acton families' tax burden. 
And the problem is finding the historical median for family, uh, for uh, average family income, uh, median income. And so we are stuck with using the average for now, but we have current data from last year and current data from this year, and so we can build a historical representation of the median. This number used to be, um, the 2016 percentage was under the 2010 percentage, and so we said that it was holding steady. Um, it's now at 5.78, which is slightly higher than 2010. Are we still comfortable with saying it's holding steady? Good. Thank you. This is new because Tom asked for more charts. This is a chart. Uh, I don't know if we're going to keep it, but it is the average single family tax bill by year comparing like and surrounding communities. Is this useful to speak to? We're pretty average. <laughs> We're pretty, yeah. I, I think it's kind of meaningless. There's such a wide range of values of homes in those towns. Okay. I just think it's interesting. It's Boxborough, as usual, have a, have a declining uh, rate of growth in their tax bill. So, uh, uh, so we talked about the appendix last time, which would include and does now include, and I'll get to that, um, the information on the average single family tax bill, average family income, percentage of income for um, Acton, Boxborough, Concord, Littleton, Sudbury, Westward. It's really small. Con um, Steve has a printout if you want to take a peek at it. It might give you some more information on why Boxborough is looking so good. So you, you feel like just, it doesn't... Just to add something to Boxborough, uh, last I saw when I was looking at the numbers yesterday, their houses are worth more than ours also. So in Boxborough, yes. Median home is higher than for Acton. Um, I don't have Maynard data, but I can, I can get it. Is that a... I I'd can't remember how we came up with this list, but it was a couple of years back. So if, if Maynard is applicable, is there any, anyone else besides Maynard? Or is there any that shouldn't be on this list? Okay. I think we looked at Sudbury because it's another uh, dual Lincoln-Sudbury town. Um, but either way, so Stowe and Maynard, and then we can decide if this is useful, and maybe it's just useful to have in our pocket. I don't know. Um, um, I I would certainly have this as a backup slide. Um, it makes sense to me. Um, it's not completely useless. It's good to have a comparison. My problem with this is that it's all well and good what the real, um, tax bill is, but it matters to me how much I can afford it. So, right, I mean, yes, that, that is true. And one of the things, Carol, I'm oh, sorry, I'll just skip to the end so we can at least talk about this. Okay, so it's pretty unreadable <laughs> getting it all on one page, so I might have to split it on two pages. Mike has a printout. So as a percentage of income, it's a better number. So the last column says, okay, here's your tax bill, but here's your average family income. So as a percentage of income, is it an undue burden? And, and for Acton, it hasn't gotten worse. Some towns it's gotten a little better. Concord has gotten significantly worse since 2010. And so maybe that's a little more useful data, but I'm not sure how to represent that in a chart or a graph. It is on the higher end of these communities. It, uh, 
hasn't changed much in the last 10 years, even though it feels like the tax burden has grown. So maybe that chart becomes a, a, maybe it's not a useful graph, or maybe it ends up in the appendix, or maybe there's just a better way to tell this story. Um, that not only, so, so the other slide, no, I'll go back to it. <laughs> uh, here, hold on. I, part of my question is what are we trying to show there? So, so this Think slide that. says, you know, we're not, our burden hasn't much changed. Is that also true of, is, is it useful to know that that's all, you know, where we are in relation to those around us or who we're comparable to? Um, and maybe, maybe it's not an important story. But the graph doesn't show burden, it shows bill. True, you're, you're, yeah, you know, you're right. So maybe it needs to somehow show the burden. Okay. Then it would show us flat, but on the higher end, but some of the other yes. communities rising on the higher end. Maybe, maybe growth, maybe growth rate. I don't think the growth rate is the right thing to do. I think the the the, the percentage number, uh, so the growth rate is too variable year to year, but showing what it is over a eight eight data point period, 2010 through 2017, mm -hmm. would show whether the burden is getting higher or not. Yeah, still in meter. The previous slide. Okay, is it count? Yeah. Is it meter comparable to Littleton? The, the yes, okay. yes. Can you see me? So the percentage of income then? <laughs> the, the calculation on the previous slide. Go back one slide. Yep. Oops, sorry. Yes. Okay. So this is the average family tax bill divided by the average family income. And as years go forward um, and we're able to capture this data, we can actually change it to the median, yep. which we've discussed is a, is a more meaningful number. Um, okay. And this hasn't changed. Um, so I, I mean, I guess I just, I, I moved this debt service slide forward. Um, it is no longer uh, an upcoming concern. It is going to be our reality as of December, most likely. Um, but I don't have new numbers yet. Um, things have changed since we've got this slide put together last year, so it'll, it'll change. The yellow part will change. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, at ALG, we discussed for the December town meeting, which has been planned, I believe, for December 10th, that um, we're going to go for the twin school, the fire station. Um, there's also talk of trying to get um, debt for... Minuteman, and potentially something else. I'm sorry, I'm not finding this part of my notes. A debt exclusion, and um, yes, and that's it for right now. This number does not include Minuteman. Do we think it should be in there? I'm hearing a loose yes. yes. And um, hopefully we will have closer numbers for the fire station as we get closer to that meeting. Uh, in light of this uh, slide specifically, when do we want to start giving these presentations? Because we want to get ahead of this as much as we can for town meeting. We don't want to be doing a lot of the PTSO things closer to spring town meeting. So while uh, nothing has been scheduled yet because it can't be done by, by district personnel, the outreach meetings for the for the school building project, of which this is the lion's share, um, is on a low simmer until September. The expectation is that most of the most of the parent age population is out of out of town for the summer, or at least not paying attention uh, during the summer. So the plan is to ramp up the uh, the outreach coffees and whatnot starting in September. I would love for us to be to have a, an approved POV as close to the beginning of September as possible so that we might piggyback on some of these coffees and or ask to uh, you know, piggyback in some manner on how, to, on, how to, on how to get this out. But at the same time, we will have the numbers that they're using uh, 
and have our numbers at least be in accordance with, in agreement with what they've got. So we're not speaking it to, so, people, so that the populace does not get two separate numbers given, presented to them. Is that general feeling? Because this comes up important later when we talk about setting the rest of our summer schedule. Uh, I mean, I just think the second we have it finalized, we should be scheduling as soon as possible. So I know there are some numbers we don't get until the end of the summer, or early fall. As soon as we have those numbers, as soon as we can make this final, we should be out there presenting. Okay. Um, these numbers have changed only slightly, but these are updated, 71% um, and 80%. And I went and looked at historical um, values for percentage, and this is not much changed uh, in the last five or six years as far as our, this is not a good graph. <laughs> as far as the, the, per, the uh, um, percentage of each, the town and the school's budgets, it's pretty much been around this for the last five to 10 years. Um, and I'm not, hold on, let me just look and see if there's anything else that's actually new. Oh, I made a quick change to one more, which was, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, so uh, increase OPEB funding by 600K, right? Is that what you said, Steve? <laughs> well, uh, so as it says there, <laughs> it's healthcare, life insurance, and deferred compensation. <laughs> I'm, I'm good that way. So do we actually want, so the, this is a live question, do we actually want to say that right now or do we want to say that over the next three to five years we want them to get to the goal of meeting their normal normal cost? Um, do we I, want to give them any leash at all or do we want to just say right now we want you to get up to the 1.5 no, million? No, um, we, we may want to, if you want pictures, we may, may want to show the history of the liabilities and say that the town has more, been more aggressive in funding so, the schools. Uh, I believe you just said that a, a chart shames a thousand, uh, a thousand <laughs> words. <laughs> so, it, it's not necessarily a recommendation, but it says you've fallen behind the curve. <laughs> but do we want to make a recommendation no, I would never over the next three to five years? You know, uh, the strategy has been to move it up $100,000 at a time but they haven't always consistently done it. So I would say get to get to 1.6 or whatever that number is okay. as, as soon as possible, but get there. So we would like to recommend that they increase by 100,000 per year. They take their current, they take their current funding increase by 100 or 150,000 a year to stem the, the rising rising liability. Yeah, I don't think you want to get too much into the weeds in, when you talk to the public. Right. But remember, this is also facing the school board and the board of selectmen document. I don't think you want to get the weeds, but I think if it was an appendix slide, which at like a 5,000 foot view just kind of encapsulated what you had, what you had said, just so they have some sense of what are the unfunded liabilities why, like, how did you get to this number or something like that? Because if you just throw it out there, it's kind of like, oh, and increase 100,000 a year to you raised by 600,000. Oh, okay, why? Why do I care? So, um, I mean, I, that's how I would put it in the appendix. And then if there's questions about it, you can just simply explain how the unfunded liability very generally works using college tuition or some other analogy. Okay, so no other changes have been made at this time. Um, did you want to discuss the committee's status? I would recommend, unless someone would like to step forth and be clerk for a subcommittee, that we um, divvy up as much of the work for the slides, the various projects that have come up as things that should be changed, and um, come back and present them to the whole committee as individual work rather than creating a subcommittee for this. 
because then we don't have to deal with keeping minutes and a bunch of the other things of hosting agendas and all of the OML requirements that make this sort of work as a subcommittee a little bit of owners. I was not at the last meeting, but there was a list of projects that I saw in uh, Christine's notes that she very nicely shared with me that I think could be divided up for various things we want to have changed, where people just took the lead on different things that they'd like to have data updated about or added to this. Um, so that's just my recommendation, please. Share. By which I mean, what are your opinions? Steve. Let me understand this. So what you're saying is that we would, or somebody would simply divide up the POV slides uh, and assign them to individuals and at some point in the future we'd come back and review the individual's work uh, and that in the meantime the said individuals would not um, discuss, uh, deliberate or collaborate with other members while they were doing this. That is exactly what I am recommending. I'm okay with that. My only concern on this is that we are trying to get this done in the next 10 weeks. We'll have, what, maybe four meetings, five meetings in those 10 weeks uh, or less. Uh, I don't know that we can do that as a, as a committee this large. And while, I'm, while I don't want to, and I certainly don't want Shelley to hear me volunteer to become clerk of said subcommittee, uh, I think we need to be able to move faster than that. What would your recommendation be for a meeting schedule for a subcommittee that would allow this to proceed faster? Uh, I think that uh, there should be a meeting on the off weeks for, for the next three off weeks to try and get this done, try and get, try and get, uh, try and, because we can break at the, at the end, during our regular meetings, we can definitely bring back the latest and greatest, get feedback. That way we don't have to wait for two weeks in between feedback. So we can, we can make changes along the way. Um, and yes, I guess I am volunteering to be the, the secretary of the, uh, or the clerk of the, uh, of the subcommittee to try and move this faster. But I, I, especially considering we've got a December 10th deadline and we got outreach starting in September, I think we need to move quickly. And I'm concerned about doing it as a committee of 11, 10, 11, 10. Other opinions? I think I agree with Jason on this because it's very few weeks if we do individual work and come back and, you know, there's not enough meetings to kind of present to the whole committee. So I think it's uh, it's a good idea to have a subcommittee and uh, work on it on alternate weeks. Okay. Um, is there anything else for the POV? So do we have to actually vote a subcommittee? No. We just uh, we just appointed uh, chair, or in this case, the vice chair has the power to appoint a subcommittee. Great. A subcommittee has been appointed already. It just has never convened. Very good. That said, were you listed as being on the subcommittee? Yes, I was. Wonderful. Anything else, Christine? Please let me know if you're available Monday the 8th. Uh, in the afternoon? Yes. Not in the morning. Um, if that's it for the point of view drafting overview, let's discuss summer meeting schedule. Can I just ask a question about point of view? Certainly. Um, so I like the percentage of income and I hope that you forecast out using trends to do the percentage of income at 2024. Thank you. Um, it has been Floated that we potentially do a summer schedule of meeting only once in July and once in August. I am strongly of the opinion that we should not be doing that. 
um, given that we are having this very important finance-related special town meeting in December. I would love to hear other points of view. I think I'm already on the record as saying we need to have lots of meetings, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no, I, I don't agree with just once a, once a month. Well, I think we should maintain our normal schedule. You know, sometimes if we're not available, we're not available, but we'll still have a quorum. Yeah, I agree with that assessment as well. It sounds like there's a lot of work to do to thin out how often people are meeting. It doesn't make too much sense with all that's going on. Now, for the information I've received so far, it does not sound like we should particularly expect to have difficulty reaching quorum at any of the... Um, upcoming meetings on the either the 2nd or the 4th, Tuesday of July and August. So if that changes, please let me know or let Roland know because he'll be back. If um, that is good for everyone, let's go on to approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to read them through? I'm going to take that silence as a no and let's spend a few seconds or minutes reading through um, these papers. I'm not going to make you do what my kids do, which is raise their hand when they're done with something, so I know who all has read everything, so just do your best. I have a suggestion that Mike just brought up. For the meeting minutes of May 28th, can we have the, can we, the near the bottom of the first page, the second, the second list of bulleted points, could we say the members of this year's POV drafting subcommittee will be? Certainly, I also should be added to that list because I remember signing myself up. Very good. Um, yep, yeah, good, perfect. I remember you signing yourself up too. Uh, Jason, I have a question for you relative to liaison assignments. The school committee, twin school building people committee, have a subcommittee um, of some form researching bonding. Yes. They claim to have a member from the finance committee of each town. Would that member be you? Yes. Okay. Fact, so we should put that under your liaison assignments? Sounds great. Although, uh, if it, it wasn't brought up in the meeting... No, no. I'm saying just in general. Yes. Yes, and I do have an update on that. In fact, I was going to ask. Uh, part of the reason why I want to have extra meetings is I want to get the sense of the committee at our next meeting. I was going to ask Roland for a couple of minutes to do a similar presentation. Move to approve the meeting minutes of May 28th as amended. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, uh, all opposed? And abstained? So aye. Okay, June 11th minutes. Move to approve the meeting minutes of June 11th. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Abstain. I do. Uh, move to approve the meeting minutes of June 12th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now, do we have a problem? Because 
we need a, uh, a we need a majority of the committee, even though the majority of the committee is not here, of the people that were in attendance. It is a majority of the committee, not a majority of who was attending. And does an abstention count? According to Roberts, we had this problem last year. Does an abstention count against the number that to, to define a quorum or not? I do not know the answer. However, we are still within, well within time limit on this meeting to bring this up at the next finance committee meeting. Because if we had Roland here and all five of us approved this, then we are both a, a majority at the time, whereas now we're four and four. Steve? I think it's just a majority um, of the people who vote. So uh, I think you could put it up for a vote tonight. You, it might be safer to just wait till Roland's here and, and you have all five of you. I withdraw my, uh, my motion to approve these minutes. Thank you. Now let's go through liaison reports. Um, Steve, can we start with you? Sure. The uh, Health Insurance Trust uh, met last week. Um, we, um, John Peterson is the new school committee rep, and we promptly elected him chair of the committee. <laughs> um, it was Peter Berry's lucky day. He wasn't there, so we couldn't do it to him. Um, yeah, we have 11 months uh, worth of data uh, reported. We are um, on track to lose the amount of money we plan to lose uh, to bring our uh, unrestricted fund balance down. Um, Beyond that, there is some concern. Uh, we uh, accepted a bid for stop loss coverage. Um, we place a limit of $125,000 on any individual claim, uh, and then we buy uh, insurance uh, after that um, to pick up the cost beyond $125,000. Um, so we accepted a bid on that, and um, the only concerning piece of data we had uh, was that last year at this time we had 24 claims going uh, that were 50% of the stop loss, which is something we monitor to see how many truly catastrophic claims we might have. Uh, and this year uh, we have 34 at that level, so it looks like uh, we may be heading for a, uh, a lot of claims. I have a couple things to report. As you alluded to just a couple minutes ago, uh, the subcommittee for looking at uh, int the interest rates and what the right approach to bonding for the new twin school had, had its first meeting. Uh, this was definitely uh, basically just a, uh, a laying out of the options, a laying out of the things that, there were to be, that we are to take into consideration. Um, I am going to request of, uh, of the chair uh, an opportunity to present to the l larger committee at our next meeting. Um, the Just as a preview, just to give you a quick heads up to think about the things that we're trying to work through is do we want to do a 20-year bond? Do we want to do a 23-year bond? Do we want to uh, pay a couple pay a, a couple million dollars out of the first years uh, uh, during the time of the bans? To minimize the uh, the amount that we have to take out as a as a as a bond, uh, are we going to uh, recommend a level principal or a level payment uh, schema? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? And which one do we recommend that we do? So we have we have a uh, you know half a dozen or so questions and variables that we're that we are tasked with chewing over and um, making a recommendation for. It is important to note that the recommendation that this subcommittee is tasked with is not going to be binding in any way, shape, or form, or is it even gonna come into play until we actually go to take out the final bond? But we are to make our recommendation to the school committee in the fall. So this is something that's coming relatively quickly, and I would like the finance committee's 
opinion input and backing on. When is the next meeting? I I'm wondering when to recommend that you get on the schedule. I don't remember when the next meeting is. I will try and find out. Um, I'll, I'll let you know, but I, I would like to meet, I would like to have time at, at our next finance committee meeting. I would like five or 10 minutes just to, to do a quick presentation and get the sense of the committee. Um, next thing, the, uh, the um, uh, we did the Minuteman walkthrough, which thank you very much, Mr. Majors, for organizing. Um, I'll, I'll, I won't steal your thunder. I'll let you talk all about that. I just wanted to highlight one thing that did come out of that meeting that I think has bearing for the wider uh, committee. The Minuteman building project is coming in at 12% of unreimbursed MSBA costs. So whatever the MSBA no reimbursement number is, they're coming in 12% below. Their effective rate, their actual rate is 12% below, which is within screaming distance of what the um, OPM for the current school building project says is standard. They, we were warned from the beginning that you should expect to, that your actual rate should be about 10% below what the MSB reimbursement rate is, and that that is a result of the um, that is a result of the uh, choices made by the school committee over and above what the MSB would, re would reimburse, and usually is a is a driven heavily by the site preparation size as well. So in our point of view, we have a recommendation to adhere to the MSBA reimbursement rate in its entirety. Um, for all that Minuteman is on, on budget and you know ahead of schedule, they are running at 12% below the MSBA rate, and I just want to make sure that we socialize that number within this committee as well as we take a look at the twin school buildings, please. To be fair, I believe part of the reason that you expect the rate to be below is because the MSBA caps reimbursement on certain elements, such as the cost, the percentage of a project that can be used for things such as siting. So it's not just that you can make non-reimbursable decisions, but there are some things that might catch you. You find that you're on ledge when you don't realize you are. I believe I did mention site, the, 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 the siting as an issue. Yep, I did. Uh, the last subcommittee uh, is, sorry, the last liaison report is the building subcommittee. We did have our first uh, detailed breakdown uh, over the last couple of um, meetings as to what is reimbursed, and what is reimbursable, what is not reimbursable. Uh, I'm pleased to report that the vast majority of things are up in the 98 to 100% reimbursable, including things that we were, had concerns about perhaps being an issue like cafeteria, kitchen, library and gym, those all come in at great numbers. The two sore thumbs that did stick out are nursing, nursing's only in the 80s, and admin spaces. The admin spaces are in a, a unpleasant 64% reimbursed space. I did send uh, an email to the chair saying that I want us to sharpen our pencils on that admin spaces number as much as possible. I will let you know if that uh, is acted upon or if it falls on deaf ears. But um, of the six major categories the MSBA tracks against, and there's actually, there's, sorry, there's more than six, but of the, uh, of the, of the categories that are, that are tracked, the only ones that we're not, that I'm not thoroughly comfortable with are uh, admin and nursing, and I'm prepared to, I suspect we'll probably have to lose on the nursing side, but I wanna fight a little more on the, on the admin space side. Those are, uh, those are the updates. Yeah, Miniman, uh, based on our latest meeting, is, is moving along at a very rapid play, uh, pace. Scheduled for the uh, opening of the uh, first Monday in September, uh, ribbon cutting uh, October 4th. Uh, but it still looks good. Uh, we also organized a tour uh, a few weeks ago for uh, uh, Board of Selectmen members. Um, other town officials, finance committee, and, and others, and uh, I think it was quite uh, successful. So um, moving forward. The, uh, the next phase is, you know, they're looking forward that for Minuteman is knocking down the, uh, the old school once the new one opens 
and uh, putting in the athletic fields, one of the issues they're having is finding people to bid on those fields. I guess it's really a, a unique uh, skill set and that, you know, that's something that they're working on. The other thing, just a comment with regard to MSBA reimbursements. The, uh, I think the, uh, in the guidelines for MSBA, a, a technical high school is kind of a nod duck, and a lot of the rooms are sort of non-standard, so it's, it's hard to really classify or put them in, into a, you know, a category that, that is the same as uh, you know, a, an elementary school or high school, junior high, uh, but it, it's kind of unique. And they did get uh, special grants from the state for other things, so. <clears throat> and their budget, their bottom line is still, still looks good. Um, the ALG met on May 20th. The school um, is aiming for having E&D come out between 4.3 and 4.5 percent. The number hasn't been finalized. They are still looking for a capital project manager. The town is aiming for a turnbacks of 2 to 2.5 two percent. There, this year has been no um, snow and ice deficit. And revenues, Brian, I believe um, they said we've been up about 1 percent overall. Revenues for the town? OK. Um, there is a push across both the schools and the towns to um, have good turnbacks. There's a lot of interest in having strong reserves for the town here as we go into all this bonding. Um, there was a comment about short-term debt having been refinanced for things relative to um, fire truck, HVAC, and all of that. Could you please speak to that? Because I don't, it was one of those I was writing and don't have good notes. Yeah, so the way we finance the, uh, a couple of items over the last couple of years is we put out bans on the streets, so bond anticipation notes for a short period of time. So we just did uh, refinancing on, I think there was a fire truck, North Acton Fire, or a few of the items that we recently had asked uh, town meeting um, to approve as, as debt payments. So we saw an opportunity, we thought, uh, to uh, take advantage of the bond anticipation notes, uh, short uh, interest term, so we, rolled what we had out in the street last year, I think at 3.4 million, we added the $1.1 million this year for the acquisition of 19 to 21 Maple Street. And uh, when the bids came back, we got about a 2% uh, note. So we're gonna roll that for another year. And But in the course of doing this, if you put out, um, if the term in a fire truck is five years, after three years, you have to pay at least uh, one, uh, the remaining number of years, at least a third of the principal. So if you, so in the third year, so you can ban, ban, if it's a five year ban, you can, uh, bond, you can ban, ban, then I think in the next year you have to pay at least the principal payment. So that's coming all due next year, but a lot of this will go permanent, like at the North Acton Fire Station $750,000 study will probably roll that into the final project. So that'll get pushed out a little bit, but it's a little confusing, but it's, um, I, I think in the long run, we've saved the citizenry some money. Um, you know, when interest rates right now are settling down and, you know, if we keep kicking it out down the road, maybe they'll come down some more. So. Thank you. Um, there has also been the revolutionary change to the ALG presentation of the financial model that the paper will now be turned sideways and we'll be able to see further out and actually look at five years. John Peterson is to thank for that. I said, we've been looking at it sideways for a long time. You can't actually read it still. Um, the Board of Selectmen has approved adding the $1 million um, for, um, that the school had in access to the stabilization fund. And I believe you've waived the 45-day requirement to have a meeting about it. The expectation is to still not use that money for another two or three years. The school is also going forward creating a capital project website which will let people see 
what the expectation was for a project, how far along that project is, and what has been spent. And I believe that's it for ALG. Kelly's Corner has not met, although things will changing with Kmart uh, lot going out to bid, but we have not had a chance to meet about that yet. I would love. Wonderful. Great. Um, just to clarify, the uh, Board of Selectmen waived a 45-day option to call a town meeting, not a requirement, right, for the stabilization funds. Um, at the top of my list is that they will be creating a man-maintaining capital improvements website, as you said. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, they have the school committee, I'm sorry, the school committee has submitted uh, their statement of interest to MSBA for the Conant School, even though it's a few years out, they want to get on the radar, stay on the radar, and if I understand correctly, they're looking for a refurbish rather than a whole new build at this time. Um, they also voted on a pay raise for Superintendent Light. Um, prior to the meeting, apparently, Superintendent Light had uh, requested not to re receive any sort of raise higher than the standard average for all teachers, so um, he received a two and a half percent raise. And his new salary is two hundred one thousand nine hundred and twenty-five dollars. <throat> the the train s South African Train Station Committee met, and uh, we had a public forum here a few weeks ago um, where they presented some of the options regarding the parking challenges that the train station has and um, essentially the <clears throat> gist of the presentation was around the trade-offs between focused on cost, convenience, and location. And <clears throat> the short of it is, is um, that was the idea put forward that we should look at level setting the rates for both the, the close lot as well as the more remote lots. And so the um, town has um, access to the West Active Fire Station as well as the uh, Mount Calvary Church for train station parking. And then the town, um, as Brian just mentioned, the Maple Street property um, will be turned into 40 spots as well as potentially more down the road. Um, and so what we met um, last week and discussed was how to sort of right size the rates between the lots. And while not a direct financial impact to the town, at least immediately, um, this uh, the idea was is we're going to raise the resident parking um, sticker rates as well as the metered rates or the daily rates uh, around the local lots and then decrease the remote lot parking just to incentivize people to. Um, at least at the margin, think more economically about where they park and how much is charged. But we generally had some agreement that over the longer run, there's still going to be significant parking needs. And a lot of this uh, conversation has revolved around whether or not to build a parking garage. And so not a whole lot of traction made on that. Um, there was some interest at this public forum to the idea from the public. But there was also some opposition to it, particularly local residents who thought the traffic in South Acton was relatively challenging as is. So uh, a couple different viewpoints and more to come on the parking garage, which would be more of a material impact if it goes forward for the town. But in the interim, uh, at least for the next year, a uh, couple of years, we're looking to just sort of right size the parking rates to balance them between the local and remote lots. And the sewer committee met, but there was nothing really material for the finance committee at this point. Uh, I was at the Board of Selectmen meeting last week, Monday. Um, a couple of talks came up, um, salient points. <clears throat> the um, town manager brought up the ambulance uh, rates, billing rates, um, and proposed to raise them to be more in line with Samara, which is the Central Mass Emergency Response Association. Um, they're going to be having some changes this coming July 1st, um, and this is just trying to get um, us to be more consistent with our neighboring towns. Uh, the Board of Selectmen uh, voted to approve that. Um, the Kmart parcel came up. Um, not a ton of new information. Um, obviously, we all know there was, a, there was a call for offers that was initiated by Stop and Shop Asset Management Group. Um, it was discussed that you know there's several options for potential buyers to extend the lease with Kmart, to replace Kmart as a tenant. Um, you could have new retail development, but that would need a site plan review. You could have planned housing, which would require zoning change. 
Um, on the 13th of June, the Board of Selectmen apparently voted <coughs> um, not to pursue buying. Um, it was uh, uh, advised by council against imminent domain without a known purpose. Um, the question did come up, could a developer still um, come in with 40B um, or a 40B plan? And uh, John Benson uh, stressed that it's really a question as to when Safe Harbor would begin. Um, uh, aside from that, there was a uh, proposal for a preliminary design for uh, um, what is uh, a proposed friendly 40B, which is 55 plus um, at 361 Great Road. Um, who sent it? Uh, Roland Bartle sent that there's a public information meeting to be held on July 10th um, at the safety facility um, at 7 p.m. if people want to attend to that. Um, the proposal was not um, a vote for a LIP application. They're just looking for initial feedback before they get comfortable doing their due diligence. Um, more to come on that. Um, the only other thing, um, the Veteran Service District Intermunicipal Agreement that was discussed last week, uh, that was approved by the Board of Selectmen um, as the contract that we had all reviewed. And with that, I move to adjourn. Yeah. Um, just a, a couple of um, updates. I think with the, um, it, it wasn't a parking garage, Dave. I think what we were talking about was a parking deck. Yeah, sorry. The, thank you for correcting me, and which, I use it too interchangeably sometimes, unfortunately. Which would add about nine net net about ninety about ninety spaces. We need more. I don't think we could ever get enough, but we do need more. Um, I did give. I just. I, I did give an update um, that Al reported on. I called it my Kmart two update. Um, and um, just, I, I can read it or mail it to you if, you, if you'd like. So you have the statement, it would just take about two minutes. But that's it. Please mail it. I'll mail it? Sure, okay. Just um, w one thing that I, I, I did want to um, say that I think that um, Al may have missed. One of the options was a, um, a buyer plans a new retail development. This would require an extensive site plan review by the town, and in this scenario, a buyer would likely seek an option to purchase from Stop and Shop while the site plan review is undertaken. Um, we, uh, the select board did not um, take a formal vote on um, not uh, attempting to purchase the property. It was just a the unanimous consent of the board, not at this time, to pursue a buy of the property. And on the eminent domain issue, um, town uh, council advised us, based on recent um, case law, that a taking of a public property for a public purpose, which is what uh, eminent domain is, can't be done to prevent a development that the town doesn't like. And that's important. And then. Uh, 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 Ms. Pickering Cook added that the town should avoid taking property by eminent domain and then deciding what to do with it. Now, um, with the um, um, certification for the two year safe harbor, we got a little bit of clarification on that last Friday at about 5 o'clock when the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development came down with its decision on the appeal of an interlocutory or non-final order by the Board of Appeals with respect to the Piper Lane property. There was an issue before the Board of Appeals um, last month where the, um, um, it, it would have been the SANA, that's the local um, um, uh, South Acton Neighborhood Association, and um, um, our town council took the position um, that a one-year safe harbor through June 15th, which we just passed, 2019, um, was in order um, because of what's called a related application. They were 
arguing that the um, a current developer had a related application to an application that was filed and rejected by the Zoning Board of Appeals a year ago. There was a developer uh, who wanted to uh, rebuild a house that burnt down in 2015 on the 90 School Street parcel, which is the access parcel to, to, the, to four, the Four Piper Lane properties, claiming um, that um, that application related to this application. The, uh, in the regulations um, regarding 40Bs, um, they're very vigilant about the circumstance where a, de a developer who wants to build a traditional development um, has it rejected by the town, and then the developer turns right around and says, I'm going to really stick it to you now. You didn't give me what I wanted. I'm going to build a 40B there. So they were trying to argue that two different developers were a related application. Um, um, the board bought the position of Santa, which was supported by our town council, that this really was a related application, so one year had to go by before they could file. So they were hoping to get a, a, a one-year hold on it until June 15th, and in the interim they had hoped the two-year safe harbor would have, would, have, would have kicked in, which it hasn't yet. Um, but they said it, it, it didn't apply. Now, what came out of this decision is information that we had been seeking about the two-year safe harbor based on our, our housing production plan. And, you know, what they had initially said was, oh, um, we, shame on us, we didn't undertake an appraisal we should have uh, done. Um, we are in, the, in doing that, finishing it up. And the question then became, when does the two-year safe harbor kick in? Is it the April 9th date that um, we, um, our town clerk signed off on it and we sent it into DCHC? What they're saying is, no, um, we need, um, when, the, when, the certificate, when the appraisal's done, we will grant the project eligibility letter. I'm hoping they get their appraisal done in the next couple of weeks. And then the town would then have to resubmit their application. Um, under the rules, DCHC would have 30 days to act on that application. They said we will act on it post haste, speed it up. The date then of the, um, of the safe harbor would be the date that the Pell letter is issued. So if um, the appraisal that DCHC undertakes comes in on July 15th, that would be the date that the Pell letter enters. That would be the effective date of our safe harbor, assuming it is approved within the next 30 days. So that's actually not bad in the sense that um, it, it extends out the two-year period, um, you know, a few more months. Where this thing got a little uh, flu is the, the way the um, uh, the, uh, the, the friendly 40B process works is um, they first meet with uh, Nancy Tavernier's group, they sign off on it, then the select board signs off on it, then the developer takes his, his application to DCHC, they grant the project eligibility letter and then it goes to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which grants, or they have to file their application for the Comprehensive Permit, Zoning Board of Appeals um, grants it over the course of the next couple of months. This application was a little different in that um, it, was, they, it was treated as an amendment to the 2004 Avalon 1 project, so they skipped the project eligibility you know, peace, and they now they said, well, no, you really have to do it, but we'll just grant it with the appraisal. You've done the work. So, if that makes any sense, it's a, it's, it's a little it, it's a little tricky, but it was an oddball situation. But the but the key thing is that the day that once the appraisal gets done, the project eligibility letter expects to be issued that day. That would be the date of safe harbor pending 
a resubmittal of the application, which DCHC would expedite. So if there's any questions on that, and then just one, one other update, um, we will, um, the select board will be in uh, Middlesex Superior Court tomorrow morning for a two-hour evidentiary hearing on the, um, the um, OML complaint that arose out of the Danny Factor application for the planning board. On a completely different topic, if I may, um, since, since we're going to be talking about bonding uh, at the December 10th for both the town, for both the school and the fire station, uh, and this cannot be me, this is not me volunteering, this is me saying somebody else has got to do this. Can we have somebody start dogging the town for giving us actual hard numbers on what, the, on what this is going to be uh, so that we can make sure that we, uh, for the fire station, so that we can make sure that uh, we have that in hand as we do all of our planning for both the POV and for figuring out what the, what the debt load is going to be in the coming, at the coming town meeting. Brian, do you, have a, excuse me, do you have an idea of the date on that? Something was mentioned, I believe, by Steve, and I don't remember what it was on when we thought we'd have close to a final number on the fire station debt. I'm sorry, what's the... What's um, the do we have any idea when we'll have a number for what we're, um, the debt will be for the fire station? The data on the fire station? The debt. For the debt, yeah, which is, well, that's what I meant by that. Yeah. Um, we're still working that right now as well, so... I mean, it, you know, the idea is, I mean, when you have the two options of whether you want level principal payments or you want declining, um, you know, payments, and we're going to have to model that out and find out what's affordable and what we can do, and it's, so it's still, we're still kicking that around. And that's we still don't even know the scope of the project yet, the full. I, I think that's. You know. So who can dog them? What? So who can dog them? When can we get it? You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't okay. have a target date. I mean, as soon as we know, I'll be happy to forward that on to you. So I know you're going to want to. Yeah, I have a question. When are we going to get that? <laughs> uh, I believe Al has something to say. Pardon? I believe you have something to say. Yeah, uh, I move to uh, adjourn this meeting. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? All abstained. Meeting adjourned.